Well, welcome. I want to focus a little bit on um, pivot shift injuries and menisci again. We're drilling into menisci pretty, pretty hard. And I'm starting out with, a, with an axial T2 weighted image from a, just a standard 1.5 Tesla machine using T2 fast spin echo. I'm sure many of you have already noticed that there's a pretty large fluid collection here and it's a blood fluid level. Uh, first point, meniscal tears don't give you blood fluid levels. So there has to be something else wrong, although that's not why we're showing the case. But as we scroll it, we see the reason for the blood fluid level. There's a fracture back here, which means something pretty, pretty violent happened, which leads me to the focus of this discussion, which is pivot shift injuries and meniscal pathology. I don't so much care about the ACL tear I'm going to show you or the PCL sprain that you're going to see. What I'm interested in is the menisci. But before we get to the case, I'm going to practice my drawing skills a little further. And I'm going to make you a meniscus kind of in a 3D here. I'm even going to try and make it have some depth. Yeah, so this is the, this is the height of the meniscus right here. And as we discussed before, we have an inner third, a middle third, and an outer third. Now when you have a pivot shift injury, and I, I think most of you can see me, um, what, what actually happens is the femur is going to go, the, the femur is going to go backwards and it's going to slam down on the back of the tibia. So when it does that, and, and sometimes there's a twist with it, sometimes it's just direct. And when it does that, it crunches not only the bone, because that's why we have the fracture here, but it also crunches the meniscus. So when that meniscus gets crunched, it often cracks. And that crack is usually a vertical crack in the outer third. It happens in almost every single person. Now if we look at the meniscus from the side, here's our side view, or sagittal view. This would be the back, so we'll call this posterior with a P. And this is the back where the crunching happens, right here. So we get this crunch, and then we get our crack, and that crack could be a partial crack which we do nothing about, by the way. That crack could be a crack all the way through. Pardon my lack of uh, steady hand here, a linearity. That is still, most often, not a surgical situation. What would you call that? You would call that a longitudinal vertical tear, as opposed to another kind of radial uh, alert vertical tear we're going to learn about, which is the radial vertical tear. So that longitudinal vertical tear, even though it goes top to bottom, we say it's full thickness, the first one I showed you is partial thickness, is almost never operated on. Now what do we mean by length? If that vertical tear goes from here to here, and we're able to measure it from here to there, that would be its length. Now how would we measure it? We would measure it by I'm going to have to change colors here for a moment. Let's say we have a coronal. We'd measure on the coronal from here to here, because that's the part of the tear that would show up. Let's say that's two centimeters. And now the tear is going forward. See, here's the tear right here. So the next slice is going to be here. We just start adding slices. So we started out on FOSS, or parallel to the tear, two centimeters. And now we add a four millimeter cut, 2.4 another 4 millimeter cut, 2.8, and another 4 millimeter cut, 3.2. So the length of this vertical tear is going to be 3.2 centimeters. Would we operate on it? Probably not. If it's not gapped, if it's in the outer third, we're still going to leave it alone, which is counter to prior teaching, where most of these very, very long vertical tears used to get sewn. Now occasionally if somebody's in there, you will see them put a stitch in it. But characteristically, this type of pivot shift tear is not surgical. Now let's take that one step further. So now that I've done my uh, very manually dexterous erasure, let's go back to our view of the meniscus from the side and our three-dimensional view. And we'll give the meniscus a little bit of depth here. I think I did a better job on this one. So sometimes 
the meniscus gets crunched. But also remember, if, and I think you can see me, the femur is going backwards, right? The tibia is going forwards like this. So there's going to be some crunching, but maybe there's a little less crunching and a little more stretching because the meniscus has to be attached to something. Remember from our, our first series, we said the meniscus was attached peripherally and at the roots, but its inner free tip, in other words, right here is free. It's floating free. So now we are stretching. Maybe we're crunching, maybe we're not. So maybe we have the vertical tear, maybe we don't, but we're stretching. And as we stretch, 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 we get a strain or a bleed or a micro bleed. That's really common. We call that a meniscocapsular strain or a meniscocapsular hemorrhagic strain. Occasionally, if it's really violent, this will break off its attachments and it'll flip over on itself. It'll tumble. That's a true meniscocapsular separation. Those are really uncommon. In fact, they're rare. Now on the medial side, it looks a lot different than the lateral side. Because on the medial side, these attachments, which I'm going to make a little different color, they're kind of like Fats Domino, a pool player. They're kind of like short little stubby things. So you don't really see them. All you see is a bucket of blood. We'll make, we'll make that red because I'm trying to be a little clever here. So you'll see some kind of fuzzy stuff here. And if the patient's a little bit unlucky, then maybe we also happen to have a little vertical tear here as well. So you might have two things. This is an extremely common scenario. It happens in almost every pivot shift. Now sometimes what actually happens is you get this, and I'm going to make my line, if I can, through some limited manual dexterity. I'm going to make my line a little thinner, a lot thinner. And instead of having bleeding back here, instead of having a pretty good, obvious, fairly thick vertical tear over here, we have something very, very thin right next to the capsule, which a lot of times our friends misconstrue as the capsule itself, but it's not. It's in front of the capsule. And so I refer to that, it's my own terminology, I call that a sliver tear. Because it's a tiny little thin line, vertical tear, vertical longitudinal tear, right next to the capsule. And this little tear frequently coexists with that bleed. In fact, it's the majority of pivot shifts. And the minority of them, but not an insignificant minority, will have pretty, pretty thick vertical tears, but still in the outer third. All of these tears, almost uniformly, are non-surgical and heal because of the vascularity of the red-red zone in the outer third. 